Hello and welcome to our newscast. I'm Daniel Che. Let's start with our first story. It's Korea-Japan relations. Korea's Foreign Minister Yoon Byung-se is in Tokyo, where he held talks with top Japanese officials this afternoon as part of ongoing efforts to resolve historical issues between the two countries. Starting us off is our Kim Hyun-bin. Foreign Minister Yoon Byung-se's two-day visit to Tokyo comes on the eve of the 50th anniversary of the normalization of diplomatic ties between Korea and Japan. He and Japanese Foreign Minister Fumio Kishida met on Sunday to exchange views on their bilateral relations, as well as North Korea and matters of regional security. But topping their agenda was the issue of Japan's sexual enslavement of tens of thousands of Korean women for its imperial army, before and during World War II. Last week, President Park Geun-hye addressed this long-running sensitive matter while speaking to the Washington Post. She said that both countries have made considerable progress in negotiations on a formal apology from Japan and reparations for its wartime wrongdoings, adding that they are in the final stages of talks. Another pressing topic that was brought to the table was Japan's push to list Meiji-era industrial facilities on UNESCO's World Heritage List, some of which are known to have used thousands of Koreans as slave laborers during Japan's colonization of the Korean Peninsula. Amid strong opposition from Seoul, Tokyo said it was looking into installing signs at these facilities that would make known as marred history as part of a compromise. Yoon is next scheduled to pay a visit to Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe on Monday and possibly deliver a personal message from President Park. Meanwhile, Abe's own special envoy, Fukushiro Nukaga, will attend a 50th anniversary ceremony at the Japanese Embassy in Seoul. Kim Hyun-bin, Arirang News. And staying on that topic, President Bak has confirmed she will attend a ceremony at the Japanese Embassy in Seoul on Monday, marking the 50th anniversary of Korea and Japan's normalized ties. Her office, her office says rather she also plans on delivering a speech at the reception. Both President Bak and Prime Minister Shinzo Abe were not expected to attend events hosted by each other's embassies. But media reports emerged earlier today that the Japanese leader was considering making an appearance at a similar reception in Tokyo. It's not apparent that Abe will attend that event. Uh, President Bach's office says the move by the two leaders will contribute to the developing bilateral ties moving forward. Going into nearly two months without significant rainfall, Kangwado Island, located in Korea's northwest, has been the hardest hit by the current drought affecting the country. President Bach Gane visited the area on Sunday, surveying local farms and a reservoir under emergency supplies. While there, she called on civilians, the military and the government to cooperate and find ways to overcome the drought. She also asked for response measures to be drawn up to handle the effects of climate change and unusual weather, which have been occurring more frequently in recent years. The government funneled in more than $38 million to provide emergency support and water to drought-stricken regions. President Park Geun-hye tapped Kim Hyun-ung, the chief prosecutor of the Seoul High Prosecutor's Office, as the new justice minister. The presidential office said Kim's administrative and judicial experience as a prosecutor and leadership are expected to help the nominee lead the government's campaign to root out corruption in Korean society. Interesting to note is that the nominee is junior to Prosecutor General Kim Jin-tae. It is unusual considering the justice minister sits in a position to give orders to the prosecutor general. The minister nominee will need to go through a parliamentary hearing before he is officially appointed. We, the latest on the MERS outbreak here in Korea is what we turn to right now. Three new cases of the disease have been confirmed today. However, there were new, no new fatalities. This comes amid mounting signs that the spread of the virus may be slowing down. Our Connie Kim has this report. Two of three new MERS cases confirmed on Sunday were medical workers who had close contact with infected patients. The health ministry said one was an x-ray technician while the other was a treating doctor. The third person diagnosed today had visited the same emergency room that treated another MERS patient earlier this month. Although the daily number of new cases has steadily declined over the past week, health officials still have major concerns. 
Two of the infections were from Samsung Medical Center and Gyeonggi University Hospital in Gangdong, hospitals which the government has been closely working with to contain the disease. The other confirmed case was from Gunguk University Medical Center, one of the seven hospitals health officials labeled as a facility where the virus was under control. These additional cases bring the total tally of infected patients to 169. More than 4,000 people still remain under quarantine. And since the first outbreak was reported on May 20, 25 people have died, while 43 have made full recoveries. Amid this, authorities have begun discussing the criteria to call an end to this outbreak. The health ministry said last week that in order to say the disease has finally stopped spreading, there would have to be no numerous cases for 28 days, which is twice the incubation period of the virus. As for a more positive take on this ongoing battle, two-thirds of the MERS patients that were exposed at Pyeongtaek St. Mary's Hospital, where the country's first MERS patient was confirmed, have fully recovered and returned home. Connie Kim, Arirang News. The Office of the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights is scheduled to open on Tuesday a new branch in Seoul to better monitor the situation in North Korea. The office is expected to take on the role of connecting human rights civic groups in the North with the international community under the UN. Ahead of this, the new Seoul office opened up its Twitter and Facebook page last week and began communicating with the public, both in and outside of the country. However, when the office officially opens, relations between the two Koreas are expected to worsen. Late last month, North Korea said it will mercilessly punish Seoul over the opening of the UN office. The wage increase issue is still unresolved over at the Kaesong Joint Industrial Complex, with North Korea still expecting the pay hike they demanded earlier this year, and South Korea rejecting it. Pyongyang demanded Seoul raise its workers' wages to 74 U.S. dollars from $70.35, and the nearly 5.2 percent hike violates what was initially agreed upon, which is a maximum 5 percent hike from the previous year's amount. With little progress in talks to settle the dispute, the regime was stuck with receiving the same pay with no increase at all for three months now. As the joint complex is seen as a beacon of hope for improved inter-Korean ties, until the matter is settled, it is likely, it is rather unlikely we will see positive developments in other areas of cooperation between the two Koreas. In order for Korea to South Korea, that is, to reach its projected 3% growth rate this year, it will need a supplementary budget of at least 22 trillion won, or around 20 billion U.S. dollars. That's according to a Hyundai Research Institute report released Sunday. It cited fallout from last April's Hewarho ferry disaster and staggering exports as reasons for the nation's slow economic recovery. But the situation is only expected to worsen as the current MERS outbreak continues. The think tank said, however, that extra government cash would help pick things up. Amid growing concerns that the MERS situation will further dent the economy, Finance Minister Che kyung hwan said he would decide on whether to draw up an extra budget by the end of this month. On Friday, it became official Kori-1, Korea's oldest nuclear reactor, will be shut down. The decision was not an easy one, with the reactor having received the green light to keep on going for two more years. But Korea has no time to get sentimental about having to let go of the light water reactor that faithfully powered the nation for 37 years, as they need to focus now on the next phase, permanent closure. Cooling down and dismantling the reactor could take more than 15 years. Korea will inject around $135 million for the research and development of 17 key dismantling technologies necessary for the process. The Ministry of Science, ICT and Future Planning will spearhead the project with 2021 set as the deadline. And once again, Greece is working to revise its proposal for economic reforms. According to the Wall Street Journal, government officials there are putting together a plan they hope will achieve the budget targets the bailout creditors want, while relying more on eliminating tax breaks and less on pension cuts than what lenders had proposed. The Greek cabinet is due to discuss the plan early Sunday, and on Monday they will meet with the European Commission, the IMF and the ECB. All of Greece's previous proposals for reforms 
have been rejected, but they are pinning their hopes on this latest revision to help them finally strike a deal with creditors. Now, moving on to other stories, you might have seen robots in science fiction movies that imitate human movements in real time. Now, a group of researchers in Korea have developed a system which makes that possible, narrowing the gap between virtual space and the real world. Our Park se -young has this story. When you wave your hand in the air, the screen moves with it. Clenching and releasing your fist lets you zoom in and out of maps, and a robotic arm imitates your movements in real time. This may sound like a scene out of a science fiction movie, but it's become reality thanks to this device that resembles an armband. A group of scientists from the Korea Institute of Science and Technology created a surface EMG system that detects movements of the hand and fingers through the forearm muscles. Muscles contract before moving. The new system sensors predict those movements in advance using the electric signals of the muscles. The system's inertial sensors track the arm's motion, making it possible for the user to operate the robotic arm in real time. Assessing the intentions of the movement too late causes a delay which is problematic when trying to detect signals in real time. The new technology processes the action beforehand through the electric signals. The technology, which was introduced earlier this month, can also be applied to the shoulder and legs by detecting signals from other parts of the body. The research team plans to commercialize the system later this year to target the healthcare and office equipment industry. Park se Arirang News. And now the weather. Heavy showers hit over the weekend, but not nearly enough to counter the drought in Korea. Unfortunately, the dry spell will return on Monday with relatively clear skies across most parts of the country. Seoul will start the day at 19 degrees Celsius and climb to 29 degrees. The mercury will rise to similar levels in most parts with Pengyongdo and Ulungdo Island topping out at a cool 20. And now let's check out the weather conditions outside of Korea, around the world. And that's all from us at this hour. Thank you so much for watching. Do have a great start to your new week.